Hey there, so welcome back to Andy's podcast. We don't do boring, and this is my spot on the little blue and green dot. And uh, welcome to all the people from around the blue and green dot, because what we're going to talk about today is something close. It's in vogue. Okay, it's in vogue. And um, our, our show is all about experience, communication, time, money, balance and compromise. Things you use every single day. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about SpaceX. Yes, everybody on the planet. And I'm joining the bandwagon. Yes, yes. And <laughs> But I'm everybody on the planet is talking about it. Not everybody on the planet, but... Uh, a lot of people are talking about it, and I've watched hundreds of hours of videos. Some are absolutely terrible, I have to say, because they're driven by enthusiasm, not really by fact and not really by experience, because um, God bless them, they're made by very young people who haven't got any experience of doing anything. So uh, they just believe exactly what... Uh, our fearless leader, Mr. Musk, is telling them, <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, we'll be going, you know. And uh, it's amazing how many, uh, how many. It, it appears to me to be young people who've uh, who've been who've just decided to go off on their own adventure and make YouTube videos, and it's just fantastic. I mean, some of the stuff they say is wonderful. So I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled about all that. But um, we're going to talk about SpaceX because my, my bubble, if you like, my bubble, experience, communication, time, money, balance, compromise. Okay, it's contained in these things. And, and my, my thing circulates like this because experience um, leads to better communication. Communication leads to gaining experience, saving time and money. There's always a balance and a compromise. There has to be um, because you'll never get everything you've ever dreamed of. Of, because the world is not made of unicorns okay so <laughs> so um it's fascinating to see this spacex thing developed but also the levels of communication through our wonderful internet um about podcasts and about uh, live streams and about all the stuff and then we just had the big launch and then we had the big blow up and everything else but the launch created a a, a, a huge um, uh, thing the news wanted to report it because it blew up you know um, if it had made it to orbit it would have been oh yeah Elon Musk launched his rocket and it went to orbit all right because we're used to seeing Elon I mean he's had a fantastic SpaceX and the engineers there have had a fantastic amount of success so they have experience with launching rockets and landing them I mean this the Falcon 9 thing is nuts I mean it's just they have got that down absolutely perfected um one of my passions is a grand prix racing motorcycles i'm a motorcycle engineer and um one of my passions on that is when you get a motorcycle that does everything everything you want it to and riders get on it and they can push it to beyond what you think is the limit um there have been great motorcycles over the years which have won the world title because they were so good and they were so balanced uh, in everything they did, it made them easy to ride, but it also made them winners because they had a lot of power, they handled brilliantly, they could do things on the brakes, which was ridiculous. So the motorcycle is the quintessential um, pilot, pilot-driven deal. Um, and it's it's uh, when you get that perfect bike. If you ask people around the world who are bike guys like me, they'll tell you, oh, it's the Aprilia RSV, the first Aprilia superbike, or it's the Ducati at the moment, or it's the um, the the TZ250 when it came out, the TZ250 Yamaha, which is such a great bike to ride. Um, so there are various motorcycles throughout history that have been slightly better. That one balance, they they found that perfect balance at the time and at the level of engineering they're at okay so you know people always talk about the greatest riders of all time well them they were the greatest riders of their time not all time um because you know, you couldn't put jeff duke who was a world champion and a british british champion many times over you couldn't put him on a modern two-stroke or even on a big v4 ducati you wouldn't even know what to do with it yes his skills if he was born in this time would transfer but uh, no they're the greatest of their time not the greatest of all time so that's my view anyway and uh, of course this is my podcast so i can have my view can't i you know so and all this is is conjecture but i love the is uh, what i'm enjoying at the moment is the communication around the world about this rocket and about what's happening uh, because we've got falcon 9 success and then the, uh, then mr Musk decided to sell us this dream about going to mars which is a uh, hundred years away minimum and um also because the, the logistics just don't add up and uh, also um it's a quantum leap but who's it who who is it a quantum leap for you know is it for us 
I mean, we all know that the world is driven by, you know, power, greed and money. So it, it's, uh, and that's not a down of you. I'm a pragmatist, you know, I'm a self-employed artist, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I don't look at the world through rose tinted glasses. I look at it as, as it appears to me. I don't watch the news either. So uh, I, I'm not interested in bad news. I like watching positive stuff. And that's why I make a podcast to communicate more positive ideas and to try and help you save time and money. But today's not about that. It's about SpaceX. So uh, SpaceX started out with no experience. This We're talking about the big rocket, the, the boost super heavy and all that and um uh, they started out with no experience at all so they built a site uh, and, and a very interesting fact you may not know when nasa were looking for a site years and years and years ago for the space program boca chica was actually number two on that list i only found this out the other day by a, a great friend of mine who's a professor and um she said yes when they were looking around boca chica was was uh, number two and Florida only got chosen, I don't know, for political reasons, I think. But, uh, yeah, Texas was uh, a number two on the list. I didn't know that, which is, it makes a lot of sense, of course. Because uh, Elon's very good at finding things that have already been used before. Right? He's, uh, he's not stupid, that man. He's definitely, you know, I'm not... Let's get this straight. I'm not dissing Elon Musk. He's a brilliant guy. Absolutely brilliant. The, the man's ideas are thrown out there, and then he gets the right people to work on them. He's not doing the engineering. Engineers are doing the engineering right um and some things he's going to get right some things he's going to get wrong because what he does is experimental everything he does is experimental the whole deal so anyway so spacex started with no experience so they built the site at boca chica based on the fact that the whole thing was experimental they're not doing this because they know it's going to work they're doing it to see if it can work so <laughs> you know space hopper and, and I missed the space hopper thing. I, I went straight to the, the boosters with three engines and I watched them take off and I watched them crash. And I thought, wow, okay, this is, this is fascinating way of doing engineering because I'd never seen destructive engineering like that. I always say creation begins with destruction. Well, it does in this case. They smash it to pieces because they have to learn. And the fastest way is failure success. And uh, every time you fail, you learn a bit more and you go on to greater success. We know that, okay? Um, and there didn't appear to be any constraints on money. I mean, money was, poof, wow, I don't know, he's got billions. So uh, the money's not a problem, but the time is. He, he goes on, on, online and makes promises, like he says is that the rocket's going to be up and running in two months. No, it's not. The engineering's going to stop it. And it's not the rocket engineering. This is what I find fascinating. It's not the rocket engineering. I mean, what they did with that rocket was quite staggering, and it, it was amazing. But it's experimental. They don't even know what's going to happen until they send it up. So for it to make it off the launch pad um, was fabulous. The other thing that happened was that before all this, yeah, we're going to Mars. And that rhetoric, uh, and there's always rhetoric because it's news, um, uh, went from we're going to Mars. Uh, this is the thing that's going to take us to Mars and the moon and all that. Uh, down to we'll be happy if it make us, makes it off the launch pad. <laughs> Which I, I was just, I find it amusing because I just think it's great. These people are getting puffing out all this stuff and then all of a sudden it's it goes from here and goes <laughs> which is great you know so they have no experience so they're learning as they go along they're gaining experience okay and they're gaining experience from previous mistakes made by other people like the russian n1 rocket biggest thing to ever blow up uh, biggest thing to fail failed three times never got it off the ground well, they got it off the ground sorry but it uh, blew up so uh yeah so they're following that but and that's the a, a multi-engined uh, rocket like the super heavy so um and it's never been done before none of this has ever been done before so we can't say oh yeah well they shouldn't have done that well they're going forward based on what well they're going forward based on uh, the vast amount of money they've got they can build these things uh, exponentially and they built a production site which is phenomenal the production site but the the, the one thing that they <laughs> they didn't consider about the, their success was the size of site they need so uh, now they're starting to run out of room, you know, good old rocket garden is going to be full and the sheds are going to be full and the boosters is going to be full. Where are they going to put them all? Well, Elon's just rented another rocket site, which has a blast tunnel. So I don't know. I think in, in the near future, one of those super heavies is going to go to that site and be launched. But anyway, that's just conjecture. I don't know whether the launch tower would take it is too big. It was meant for space shuttle, so I don't know whether it's the same size. No idea. But anyway, uh, but he's not stupid. He's looking ahead. He's four, four or five steps ahead of the rest of us when it comes to what his next bit of plan is. Um, time. Now, the time on this is always the time is being led by the media. 
and Elon's a media freak. So he is making promises and then expecting his organization to deliver them. You know, I did meet a man once who made satellites for NASA. And the first one they built was... <laughs> they were told to build a satellite. And, uh, and they built one. It was half the size of a house. And the generals all walked into this room. And this is from the horse's mouth. And they said, what the hell is that? And they said, you told us to build a satellite. There it is. And he said, we've only just got men off the ground. How are we going to launch that? Make it smaller. And he said, and the, the engineers all looked at each other and said, look, sir, the technology doesn't exist. And he said, well, invent it then. And they literally walked out. And when that man left the organization, 40 years later, the satellites were this big and they were packed into a cube. And when they deployed, they all split out and became separate little satellites, which is exactly what Elon's launching right now. Um, you know, his internet satellites and all that stuff. And everybody else is on the bandwagon too. I do worry about the amount of junk up there, but, uh, but uh, it's no problem. Elon's going to get a, a, a munching rocket and go around and pick up all the, all the trash. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I just think it's fabulous, isn't it? I watch space programs, like, yeah, well, look at James Bond, it's in the James Bond film, you're fine. So anyway, um, so the time is as fast as possible, but it's being set by the media, but it's also being set by, by other constraints, like, we have to do this. Because they've gone from launching five tons or whatever the Falcon 9 carries, I don't know, um, but small payloads to this 150 tons, which the big rocket's going to carry. Now, why do we need 150 tons? That's what I want to know. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got to move stuff to build a moon base. Yeah, okay, lots of construction equipment, lots of stuff. Fine, but that, yeah, 150 tons at a time. Wow, we saw what happened to the rocket when it had nothing in it. So, um, and, uh, so he's got a lot more work to do on that. But why do we need to carry 150 tons? It makes space travel, it's going to make space, uh, it's about economics apparently, a lot of the explanations are talking about the economics of space flight and the economics of getting stuff into orbit. Okay, we all want to get things into orbit, why? The communication satellites ring in the earth, security satellites are ringing the communication, I mean it's just more and more and more, what for? I mean, we've all got things pointing at the Earth that are going to tell us more information about the Earth apparently and let us communicate better. Um, Shouldn't we be sending things to the bottom of the ocean? Hmm, bit of a quandary that one, isn't it? Yes, yeah, bit of a, you know, um, we're trying to get off the planet, according to Mr. Musk, um, because we need to be a spacefaring society. Um, that's that's fine, but uh, we also need to <laughs> we also need to worry about what our own planet's doing, and we've we've abandoned that a long time ago. So. Um, <clears throat> So the commercial constraints are what's leading the timelines. The compromise. Where's the compromise in building rockets? Well, they're fully experimental. So the compromise is uh, safety, the environment, and the design. The design is meant to get as many rockets, as many engines to fire and lift as much freight into the air um, whilst keeping it reasonably safe and uh, um, not killing the environment around us. Um, I mean, they, you know, this thing is a gigantic... Um, bomb if you like it's a cylinder containing fuel so if it, if it goes off on the pad well there'd be nothing left of the pad we saw what happened when it took off so um and then the balance where's the balance well the balance is time money uh, versus commercial considerations um versus how fast can, you know uh, what are we going to learn every time we launch it so there's a balance which leads to the experience okay we're balancing how many rocket engines we can fire, how fast we can lift this thing into the air versus whether it's going to blow up or not. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a compromise, but the balance is how much can we do? You know, should we keep with Falcon 9? I mean, Falcon 9 goes up virtually every day now and it's a massive success. So what's the, what's the reason for jumping from, from Falcon 9 launches, which they do almost every day, um, to 150 tonne rockets? I can see the freight value, but you really think with everybody wants to be in space, you really think the cost is going to come down with a 150 ton payload? <laughs> I don't think so. That's, that's a ruse. So, um, of course it's not, because demand is skyrocketing to get things into the sky. So when demand goes up, so does the price. Surprise, surprise. Anyway, so that's <clears throat> so the, the whole thing about the engineering. Let's get back to the engineering of it. When the rocket took off, it blew the launch pad to pieces. Well, that's because the launch pad was, you know, <laughs> it was guesswork. Absolute guesswork. Fondag concrete. Oh, yes, it's going to stand up to the heat. No, it isn't. 
it didn't do with it, it you know they were destroying it when they first fired those engines up for they fired 14 engines 11 engines whatever it was twice for 14 on 10 seconds or 14 seconds and it it, uh, it blew the concrete to pieces so then they tell us that oh no it's fine and they fire uh, 30 engines because they can't get can't get them all to fire up 30 or 31 engines and then they say oh no the launch pad's fine yeah for five seconds and they were at 50 percent throttle so they knew full well what was going to happen to the concrete because they're not stupid they're engineers and if they can't do the math well they shouldn't be an engineer math doesn't lie you know how much thrust is coming out of that thing and you know what the operating temperature of fondag concrete is that exceeded that by a mile right the fondag ma manufacturers must have been going well <laughs> this isn't going to work so also the design was done to get it done quickly it's all about time now 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 right but it's also experimental so how do we do it well we've got this much space let's just build this you know and the damage to this site was extensive okay so the tank farm is it too close uh, probably but if you have to super chill the liquids to get them to the rocket you don't want to spend more time running them underground and the and the pressurization and the, and the temperature uh, raising and the stuff boiling off so it's a fuel cost issue but it can't be really with 200 tankers filling these tanks all the time the tank farm took a complete beating so that's obviously way too close or needs to be shielded but they built a funny sort of burmy concrete wally thing which was <laughs> made out of sacks and rope and bits of steel and bit of concrete um which didn't appear to do anything really um well I'm, and i was very surprised that it was actually in one piece so but the the launch pad itself you could see the major engineering problem with that um and the concrete but now we're on to this steel deflector plate we're going to do a water-cooled steel plate i mean the, the amount of water you need is vast so where's that coming from certainly not coming from the brownsville main deer anyway <laughs> and uh, where's that coming from and also um elon recently mentioned that the plate will be in the tension and compression oh really well i'm a tree guy i'm a wood sculptor right and one of the tests you do when you're when you're using chainsaws is you have to show that you understand when they lie up put a log down on the floor you have to just you have to tell them which part is under compression and which part is under tension and that dictates which way you cut it Okay, so it's we're back to tree engineering, which is very old. And um, so tension and compression. But what happens when you apply a massive amount of heat? It doesn't matter if it's water cool. That's going to vaporize instantly, according to everybody. So when it vaporizes instantly, the temperature is going to be directly on the steel plate. If it's under tension, um, okay, it, it could be like a truck bed. That, that, that they raise truck beds in the middle, so when they fully load them, they go flat. Great. But when, what happens when the temperature pushes it flat and then the, the, the vast temperatures generated by the rockets start to distort the plate? And also, the other thing that nobody wants to explain is it's on sand, um, and the sand is a crystalline structure which doesn't react well to heat. Put a blowtorch on a pile of sand, see what happens. And um, also, the compaction of the, of the sand is everything's done super quick. Um, I build sandcastles and I compact them properly and they don't fall over. But the amounts of water I use just in a bucket are just phenomenal. So how they're going to stop uh, the erosion underneath whatever they put on top of it, I'm not sure. Especially with rising water tides and potential hurricanes. What happens if they have a massive storm surge which engulfs the entire site? Now I've been to SpaceX and I couldn't get to it because there was a storm surge and a high tide and it was raining. So the road was completely engulfed. So I don't, you know, if you can't even get to it on the road, how are you, how are you going to protect the site from the ocean? Nature's a fickle thing and you won't beat it. So, so that's one thing. And then when they put the concrete on top to put the steel plate, the steel diverter plate, the heat plate, whatever the hell they're calling it, how are you <laughs> a how are you going to stop the sand eroding underneath it how are you going to stop the sand compressing and how are you going to make sure that the concrete um, under the steel plate due to the massive amounts of heat after the steam after the water is vaporized how are you going to ensure that the concrete doesn't crack under the plate because we already know fondag can't stand the temperatures and the steel is going to t is going to transfer the temperature now I'm not being a downer here. I'm just asking questions. I'm not. A, I'm not a concrete engineer. I'm not a steel engineer. Uh, but from the state of some of that steel on that launch pad, it's extremely distorted. And that the, those plates are big. The launch tower actually seemed to do quite well. The OLM and the plating on the outside. But the flames had gone by then. I mean, they were underneath it, not 
on the side of it so that that looks all nice and shiny but those legs took a right beating and also the side of the uh, of the uh, uh, chopstick tower took a real beating too and uh, <laughs> where they use the thin tin sheet on the side of the lifting crane mmm look what happened to that so so not using concrete will take away will it will it take away this explosive force and hurling objects for 2,000 yards in every direction. Um, uh, that big piece of concrete that came off and went up the side of the rocket as it was taking off was extremely worrying. Um, <laughs> but not as worrying as the ones that were ejected into the Gulf of Mexico. So, and I'm not, I'm not ranting on about the environment here. What I'm saying is this is what actually happened. So the experience they gained from that means they have to mitigate, they have to do something to stop that happening again. Otherwise, there's one thing that controls all this stuff for SpaceX. The one word that he's used for the entire time, reusable. Now, they can't be reusable if you have to repair it, every, the launch pad every, every single time you use it. It's not gonna be reusable, it's not gonna be a Falcon 9. So they, the technology on that has, has become wonderful. I don't understand why they've tried to make this techno leap to this massive rocket when they could have just doubled the size and, and done more Falcon Heavy launches. There must be something that they want to put up there which weighs a colossal amount which just can't be lifted off the planet at the moment. I'd love to know what it is. Perhaps it's Elon's brain. Who knows? But it's, there's something... There's some consideration we don't know about. So the why they're doing all this is to uh, make us a space spacefaring race. And now I can see that, but not when we're still landing capsules in the ocean, dropped down by parachute. Um, yeah, the technology's never improved on the on the ocean landings for 60 years. So we're still using old tech. Okay. So, uh, oh, and sorry about the noise. It's my man who's just turned up to do uh, groundwork, who's a fabulous guy. Um, anyway, um, he knows about engineering. Used to be a bricklayer. But anyway, so that's my podcast today, is what, what are the consequences of learning when you have no experience, um, uh, having a vast amount of money to do whatever you want, um, making timelines that seem impossible, compromising you're not compromising because you've got all the money in the world and you can do whatever you like. So there's very little compromising except when it's stopped by other people. And where's the balance? Where's the balance between super successful Falcon 9 and, and just colossal engineering challenges with super heavy? So I, I don't know the balance there. And there's a reason in the middle. There's in the middle of this little seesaw, there's a reason. The fulcrum of the seesaw is a reason we need to go from Falcon 9 to super heavy. And I don't know what it is. I can't figure it out unless there's something massive we need to lift. So that's, those are questions. These are all questions. I find it fascinating how on one side there are people who are super enthusiastic. And on the other side, there are people who are saying, uh, but we all know if you do this, you're going to get this, like lots of heat, concrete breaking, steel bending, um, uh, ejection of materials at high speed. So I think one of the things that's going to stop Elon this time, uh, his two-month timeline is an absolute non-starter. Not going to happen. Um, what's going to stop Elon this time is, uh, is the FAA and the permissions. And I think they're in big trouble with that. And um, because he is going to have to make sure that that site is safe. And it's obviously not safe. I mean, I can see the photographers being moved back after it destroyed a car and wiped out every camera there was. Um, and they won't like that. The public will go, no, no, it's not safe. Well, if they say it's not safe and they make ground zero bigger, um, we won't get as good a view, but I think it's, you know. And we're only killing cameras. Well, that's fine, but it's, it's all got a cost. Um, and what's the cost? Just for entertainment? You know, the thing where the car was destroyed went viral immediately. Um, fine, but then people realise that when a rocket takes off, it blows the concrete pad to pieces because they're not engineers. That's all they saw. A piece of concrete travelled 1,500 yards and wiped out a car. So, yeah, okay. They, they, it's, it's splash value. It's not, it's not real, real life, you know. Real life is having to buy a new car. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm very interested to see how this develops, and and um, he's learning by by experimenting, uh, learning by experimenting, and that gives him experience as to what to do with the next experiment. The communication is extremely limited um, because it's you. He doesn't want to tell everybody everything, and that's fine. But I think 
uh, real engineers need to step up and say this won't work um, and there are a lot of people who've never commented on anything in their lives I don't think so this experimentation has improved and helped people communicate which I think is fascinating um, there's a lot of very very clever people out there and they're just watching and they don't usually talk well they're actually speaking out now and say well look if you do the math this doesn't work and they know that because math doesn't lie um, and but he's got unlimited amounts of money so he can do whatever he likes so and that's fine and I don't mind the experimentation I think it's a brilliant system but it's very destructive um, it's extremely wasteful but at the same time he's not bothered about that he's bothered about getting the rocket off the ground so uh, one of the things that sort of tips you off to the fact that it's not running properly uh, I'm a good old two-stroke motorbike guy um, when your rocket takes off and it's going um, engines already misfiring dear Yes, they don't sound like that when they're running well. <laughs> and so, uh, <clears throat> also, there needs to be a redesign of the booster, doesn't it? Because uh, when the engine went out, it destroyed his hydraulics. It destroyed the, uh, the, um, the way you could steer it. So, there you go. The engine's destroyed the, the actual telemetry part. So, yeah, going to have to be a bit of a redesign on that bit, I think. Um, and also, whether these engines, he's admitted that we didn't know what happens when you put this many engines together in close proximity. Well, you do now. If you look up into the engine bay from those fantastic, I have to say the camera work this time was amazing. Uh, if you look up into the engine bay, it's already on fire. So uh, the engine bay itself is on fire. So um, it's a shame they can't recover that. Uh, they never recovered that booster because, wow. I mean, the damage to the engine bay would have been phenomenal. So I think he's got a lot more to do than just send the next booster up. Um, and obviously the launch pad is the major consideration because it's not reusable. At the moment, he's got no solution because there isn't one. It's an experiment. But he has to do real engineering this time and put this thing right. And I think there needs to be a redesign of the site. That's my uh, conclusion from this. There isn't enough space. They haven't made it. They didn't make it right in the first place because it was an experiment to see whether it could get it off the ground. And that's obvious, okay? So what's happening now is that we're having to re-engineer things. But is he going to do that? Or is he just going to put a lick of paint on it, put a steel plate under it and say it's fine? I think that's more likely to happen, which I think is a real shame because I think it'll just destroy the steel plate as well. And what happens if it bends the steel plate? You're going to go and cut it up and make another one? Or you're going to come up with something else. Um, if you're going to do this sandwich plate, which is a good idea, water cooled, you, where's the water supply? Also, how are you going to mount it to the concrete and how big is the concrete deflector area going to be around the engines? Because they destroyed it. They didn't just destroy underneath the rocket, which dug a 25, 30 foot hole. Um, they destroyed, you know, for 50 meters in every direction. So how are they going to fix that? I think this deflector plate needs to be way bigger. But of course, you're right next to the, the uh, chopsticks and the lifting tower. So you're going to have to heavily shield all that as well. Um, and the amount of shielding, you're also going to have to shield the tanks because you can't risk puncturing the tanks. Um, you know, the li liquid fuel in them. Or are they all going to be empty so it'll be fine? <laughs> so I think there's a lot of engineering to be done um, the two month timeline is impossible and um, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm such a fan of this I just want it to work I want that, to, that rocket to get up there um, but I think we're still part of a big experiment and I think the experience has been learned by experimentation um, and we need better communication between people who really can do the math that's going to save Elon time and money in the future like if he redesigns the site it, he'll save himself time and money but I think we're still running an experiment so <clears throat> the balance is the, there is no balance it's get it done you know time is money that's that's what you're going to hear um, and the compromise is well there isn't a compromise we're going to launch this thing come hell or high water. Um, so that's it. I mean, it's so it's an interesting spin on what I do. I mean, it's I would go to engineers whose experiences with rockets and he's obviously done that. He's studied all the stuff. So but they've never experienced anything like that. So it turns it from experience to experiment. OK, and the communicating with people. Well, a lot of people who worked on the old programs are dead and uh, and um, and they're they're their technology was limited by their materials so the things that went off 50 years ago it's, it doesn't make any sense now because our materials are so much better greatest of all time remember no greatest of their time 
So um, the time is is a timeline that he's under commercial consideration. He must be. Um, nothing else is driving it, just money and greed and being first. And the money is not in question. Um, so there we go. So it's an interesting thing on SpaceX. Thanks for listening. I'm having a great time watching this, but I'm also having a great time watching how many people are communicating about it and also watching how they communicate what they know and put it into the mix, put it into the flow of ideas and then watching other people who've got no idea about such things. Um, <laughs> um, uh, they, they don't know the engineering and even if they do know the engineering and math, they're so young um, they haven't got the experience to know what should be done first. They just want it to go up in the air so they can be excited, which is <laughs> fantastic. We're all about entertainment on this planet. So, uh, yeah. So I think that's it's it's a fabulous mix, and I love the way it's going. And I've been uh, thinking about doing this podcast for a while, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, my name is Andy Hancock. We don't do boring. And remember, just like Elon, creation begins with destruction. Yes. <laughs> so I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening and pass it on. And uh, let's all have a good time watching him rebuild the launch site. <laughs> see you next time. Bye.